So starting off with private equity, what is private equity like? Private equity is the category of capital investments in which a fund makes private investments on behalf of investors. That's the technical definition of private equity. That's about as, that's about as technical as you can get. Darren, it's like you just sign out of Zoom to make sure we're still recording here. Okay, we're good. Okay, I have this in quotations because what we really mean when we say private equity, or private equity, when it's referred to kind of colloquially in conversations in finance media, is this definition that you see here, which is the category of capital investments in which a fund buys a private company or brings a public company private under singular ownership. So private, private equity companies purchase shares with the expectation that they'll be worth more by a specified date. And if you don't walk away with anything else from this presentation, just walk away with that is when we refer to private equity in the finance media, we're typically referring to firms that are going to buy out other firms and either bring those firms private. Um, well, they're going to bring those firms private, but they're either going to buy public shares, they're going to buy a public company and bring it, bring it private, or they're going to buy a private company and it's going to be a change of ownership. And then they're going to buy it at X price, they're going to do some things to it, and they're going to sell it at X price, at well, Y price, that is a multiple above X price. Some key terms that we need to know, alternative investments. You're going to see this a lot um, in kind of in the conversation of private equity um, and in media and in education surrounding what these companies do. It's basically any investment, it's basically any um, investment in an asset class that's not public stocks, um, bonds, or cash. Sponsor slash GP should sound very familiar from last week. When you're talking about fund structure, the sponsor is the uh, company that's it's, it's the firm that's the GPs, it's the firm that's sponsoring the deal. And so GPs and sponsors are going to raise money from what's called LPs. And the LPs, the money that the LPs give to the sponsors is going to be put into a fund. And the sponsor's responsibility is to invest that fund accordingly. Leverage is a firm that you're going to see a lot. Leverage refers to, it's another word for debt. Um, leverage is basically, it's other people's money. It's borrowed money, uh, borrowed capital. Um, and it's called leverage because it's kind of this idea, kind of, I guess, borrowed from physics, where you leverage something, you can kind of multiply its effect. So the more leverage that you use, the higher returns that you can get. And then you're going to see management. This is not really like a general term, like it is referred to like in other kind of, kind of business education. Management, as it, as it pertains to private equity, refers to the C-suite. It's going to be your CEO, your CFO, um, your CIO, your chief marketing officer, the people at the very highest levels of these companies that private equity firms are buying up. So now we're going to cover types of private equity. So you're going to see kind of a, there's there's a kind of a semantic game because I mentioned you have private equity and then you have real private equity. So what I mean by real private equity is this traditional bio private equity. Again, what everybody means when they say private equity, it's going to be your firms like Carlisle, KKR, GTCR, um, Cerberus and Blacks that are kind of all we often moved in with this group. Um, although I'm going to cover something about them uh, in, in a little bit. Um, hedge funds are also a form of private equity, although they don't do the same thing that traditional buyout private equity firms do. These are firms like Melvin Capital, Citadel, and Bridgewater. Can anybody tell me the difference between a hedge fund and a private equity fund? Anybody in the audience who knows? Okay, so they differ mainly in their investment strategies. Hedge funds are a lot more liquid um, in their investment strategies, and the funds have a shorter term, have a shorter time frame. So if you're traditional bio private equity, uh, you're going to have what's known as a closed end fund, um, and the actual dollar amounts that are required to make these funds happen is a lot larger as opposed to a hedge fund, where they're buying a lot more liquid assets. So where private equity companies would be alternative at alternative investments, hedge funds are typically buying, um, finding ways to purchase uh, stocks, bonds, and commodities. Um, in ways that are going to give them, that, that are kind of going to beat the market, beat the S&P 500, as opposed to your traditional private equity companies that make e-liquid investments. An example of this is if you were to buy, you were to buy, a, if you were to take a public company private and you're an LP investor in the private equity fund, it's not going to be very easy for you um, to just take your money out because your money is being put to work and 
there, it's not it's not like a security that has an assigned market value and is easily denominated. If I'm an LP investor in Carlisle, they're buying a company and they're they're making it more efficient. And they're adding value to the company with the idea that they're going to sell it for more than what they bought it for. I can't just call my money back. That's why these are typically closed end funds. If I'm investing in Melvin Capital and they're buying securities. I can call that money back, and then my proportional share of the fund can just be sold. Um, so that's why these hedge funds are a lot more liquid. Uh, they're also considered a lot more risky than traditional private equity and come with higher returns. Then you have your VC funds like Sequoia, Anderson Harvard's Founders Fund. Um, these are going to invest in uh, startup stage companies, companies that either like have just started generating cash flows, don't have or don't have cash flows yet, and need that seed funding to get up off the ground. And then a new kind of classification that's coming up very recently is real estate private equity, which is really my world, and these are your Starwoods of the world, Brookfield, and Rialto Capital Management, which is actually the company that I'm going to be returning to uh, come summer of 2024. The reason why, kind of a way to illustrate the, the kind, of, kind of the semantic differences here is, although I'm working for a real estate private equity company, and they have a private equity fund structure, if I were to go around to people and I were to say, yeah, I'm graduating UF and I'm working for a private equity company. That would be very disingenuous of me. Because everybody knows when you say, I'm going to work for private equity, I'm going to leave investment banking, I'm going to work for private equity. You see a headline, private equity is doing X, Y, and Z. You're referring to these, buy out private equity funds. And then, kind of when you look at the industry of private equity post great financial crisis, and this is why these two firms are here to the side, although a lot of other firms here do this. We kind of have this new type of firm that's coming up, which is just known as an, an alternative investment firm or an alternative investment fund. So you're not just doing buyouts. You're not just buying real estate. Your investment strategies are very diversified. So a company as big as Blackstone, they're going to have funds that they're going to pitch to investors that are going to do buyouts. Blackstone is very active in the real estate markets. And Blackstone, I learned today, even has a venture capital arm in which they invest in VC and more in which they invest in startups. And that's kind of a similar story with uh, a similar story with servers capital management. Okay, so for those who were here um, last week, this is going to be very topical and it's going to be a learning experience for those who weren't. Kind of just to really get into this semantic game. What we're going to do is I want you guys to tell me um, out of the whatever entity, and I'll give you some background context for these firms that appear here, which is it? Is it one of these three, two of these three, all of these three, and which one is it? So can anybody tell me what, out of these three categories, it could be one, two, or all, or none, what the Nebraska Public Employees Retirement System is? And it's a, it's a pension, it's a pension system. Anyone have any ideas out of these categories? Let's go Alex and Deb. I'm guessing a fund, just because they're going to be more liquid assets versus like an own company. Okay, that's a good, uh, you're, you're going on the right track, that's a good idea. The assets of pension funds aren't necessarily going to be liquid. What you see a lot and what you saw, for example, with the current event, a lot of pension funds were actually invested in that fund, and just in that company that just closed the giant fund. Um, so it's not necessarily e-liquid. What they're trying to what they're trying to do is there's some calculus regarding um, the balance of like liquid investments versus e-liquid investments because they do have liabilities, which are the pension payments that they have to match their assets to. But part of their strategy and the way that they're going to diversify is by having those different um, liquid and e-liquid investments. Because if your investment is e-liquid, kind of the idea is you're going to require a higher rate of return to compensate you for that e-liquidity. That's a really good guess, and you're right. It's a fund, and it's not either of these things. It's not private equity. Um, it's, it's just not, and it's not tr private equity in, in the sense that it's not a traditional buy on private equity fund. They're not going out there buying companies. So, an organization. So, this is a this is a real estate company, um, and they buy retail buildings. So, they own the building that Trader Joe's is in, that the nail salon is in, um, that you go and you in your car, you go to the shopping closet. Out of these three categories, what are we thinking? Let's go black hoodie. What's your name? A bead. A bead? What are we thinking? Maybe private equity. So that's actually something <coughs> that's not. And that's because when I say private equity, I'm meaning private equity colloquially, as, the, as in the way that everyone uses it. That, that, that's kind of how I'm ended, like, notating it with the, with, the, uh, with the quotation marks. It is a fund because 
the what the company does is it raises money through a fund structure. Um, it makes investments on behalf of their investors in the fund, and then they make management fees, and then they make their promote and their carried interest, and all the stuff that we talked about last week. Um, and it is private equity because the offering is private. I can't go on the stock market and then invest in certain funds. It's it's a it's a private equity company. And this is this goes down to like the difference between, for example, a company that I'm going to be working for. It's not I'm not working I'm not working for private equity in the colloquial sense, but I am working for a private equity company that has a fund structure. If that makes sense. What about DTF and public? What do you think? Yeah, and. We'll get into how they're kind of connected. Let's go. Uh, name's Andrew. I'm going to go with just private equity in one in the middle. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and that's right. These, these companies, and I'm assuming the parent company, DTF, and then Publix is private ownership, but DTF is private ownership as well. That's private equity, too, because the, all, that, all that that means is that the equity is private. Um, I could invest, for example, if I knew the family, I think, it's called, I think it's the Jenkins family that owns Publix. If I knew them, and then they offered me shares as a private offer, I could buy into Publix stock. And they do give their employees stock, and they have the ability to do that because they own the company. Um, and then there's going to be performance um, as it pertains to that stock, and I'm sure that Publix pays their employees. So that's one of the incentives for staying there long is that you get dividends from those stocks. Um, but I can't go in the stock market and buy Publix stock. And the parent company that owns DTF, and a lot of the other entertainment places around Gainesville, they're not on the stock market either. This is private equity, but what they're not doing is raising a fund and representing LPs. Publix isn't raising a fund um, and representing their LPs, you know, buying Trader Joe's and, and buying different things, uh, buying different assets, if that makes sense. How about Meta? What do we think Meta is? All three. <coughs> not, well, it's a creative guess, but no. Um, what in the hat? What's your name? Lewis. Lewis? Um, I would say that they're probably um, a fund because you can invest in them. That's, um, well, you definitely can invest in them, but they're not a fund. The nature of a, well, the nature of a fund in the way that we're discussing it now is that it's private. So Meta is actually none of these. Meta is none of these. Meta is a public company and you can buy Meta on the stock market. Um, it's not a fund because they're not they're not raising money um, from LPs and they're not acting as GP and they're not investing their money on behalf of LPs. They're investing their money on behalf of their shareholders, but that's not a fund structure. Uh, they're not private equity because you can buy and sell Meta stock on the stock market and there's no one entity that has a majority interest in Meta. They're not private equity because Meta doesn't. Well, Meta might do acquisitions. They're not a private equity company in the way that it's in the way that this word is, is used. Does everybody understand? Okay, Apollo. Apollo raises money on behalf of, um, well, it, it raises money from LPs and invests that money as GP on behalf of the LPs and it buys portfolio companies. Out of these three, which ones are they? Yes. I'd say like maybe fun and the second private equity. Um, it's a fund because it like manages money from individuals. Yeah. And it's private equity because it invests by um, taking other firms or other them. Yeah, it's a good guess. It's all three. It's a private equity company. It is, this is a traditional buyout for a private equity firm. Apollo buys, um, actually, I don't have to tell you, I can show you right here. This is all the companies that Apollo either owns or has bought out. And this is this is kind of a slide that they would show when they're trying to raise money for a new fund. Is we're, we're Apollo, the individuals at our firm have expertise in not only buying, but you know, for the ones that they've exited, exiting and then successfully managing and adding value to these companies, and you can see some brands that you automatically recognize. So when you were a kid and you bought a Twinkie, a little bit of your money is going back to Apollo uh, and the LP investors. Uh, you see Claire's here, you see AMC. They actually owned AMC before the whole AMC fiasco. So you can kind of see how companies can sometimes go back and forth. They can, you know, you can buy it off of the off of the public markets. Buy a company, a private equity company, can buy a company off the stock market and then um, relist it with a new IPO. Um, let's see what else do you see here? GNC, ADT, big big company based out of Boca Raton. Is that weird? I have a question. Yes. Why is it private equity, like Apollo? Why the the second term in the, the slide before? Why is it private equity? 
because the offering is all private. So you can't go and buy Apollo on the stock market. Right. The, the offering is, is private. When, when investors want to invest in Apollo, um, I can't, for example, I, here, here's, here's a good way to put this. I can't invest in Apollo. I, I wouldn't be able to. I don't know people at Apollo. I don't have the relationships with the people who are fundraising at Apollo. I don't have relationships with the investment bankers who are trying to fundraise on behalf of Apollo. Um, there is no way for me, as in my current state, uh, to invest in Apollo. That's why it's private equity in this one here. Because it's a private offer. Does that make sense? Yes. So can it be private equity without being a fund? That's a really, really good question. And that's like a kind of a semantic question because you typically, that's a great question. You would typically, ask, I'll answer it like this. As private equity is used, in the, in, you know, as I'm trying, kind of trying to describe, not confuse you guys by drawing this distinction. As private equity is used, again, in education, uh, colloquially in conversation in the financial media, it would, it would be atypical for it to not be a fund structure. Although theoretically, theoretically, if I have a, have, a, have a company, you know, it could be a private company, and I have shareholders, and on the, my, my directive as management is I'm going to buy out companies, um, I add value to them and sell them. I, I'm a, I could do that without a fund structure, but the fund structure kind of enables what private equity companies do. Because it'd be very hard for me to, on my own accord, on my own volition, raise that much money to be able to do that. But the fund structure enables this kind of investment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, because private equity is just continuously raise funds. So. Correct. But like, correct. I, like there, are, a person as an entity could be a private equity in quotations because and they don't raise funds um, by itself, right? Yeah. By themselves. The, 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 yeah. the, yeah. the, the way that I think about it is a fund would most likely be leveraged buyouts, but private equity colloquially could be like M&A activity. Okay. So like if you're, if you're a private practitioner purchasing and buying and selling business, an angel investor could be a private equity yeah. investor. Okay. So I, okay. I can see where, where it gets confusing, but right. it's good to differentiate a fund can be your typical VC fund where you're raising capital, private equity colloquially is just M&A practice. And then the middle one would probably be like, if you're just publics and you, you don't, you're not public. So it's public and private for the middle one. Okay, wait, so a VC firm is not considered, it's it's under the fund and not private equity? Yeah, because, because if I'm like, okay, like I work for private equity. There's, there's not one person in the world well, in the finance world, who's going to think, associate what I just said with, with the, okay, he works for VC. Okay. I would say I work for VC. If I say I, I work for private equity and I'm working at Rialto, which buys commercial real estate debt, it's no one in the world is going to think that I work for that I work for a company that's doing leveraged buyouts. Okay. And, and, and that's why we have this in quotations. Just okay. just that when it's in conversation, that's where it can kind of get confusing when like, it's like, okay, Rialto is a, real, is a private equity company, they raise funds. The structure is the same. The structure is the same, the same. But, but it's not, okay. when, when we're saying, okay, we're gonna do a lecture on private equity, everybody knows we're talking about, you know, Apollo for the world. Yeah. The, okay. the ones that do this, or, or this, Yeah. Okay. right? Okay. And that, that's the point of this whole kind of, okay. like the semantic part. It's because of the LBO, right? Right. Because uh, Rialto, do they do LBO? They, they don't, no, they don't do LBO. So it's more, like mostly just equity investment. Well, you know, they do they do the equivalent of LBOs for properties, but you know, you wouldn't call that an LBO. You would say you're gonna you're gonna buy a property at X L T V. There's not really like a name for that. You could do like a real estate, you know, it'd be a real estate syndication when you're have you know different you have equity investors and you're leveraging different different tranches of debt to buy a property, that'd be a syndication. Um, but you wouldn't call it an LBO. Yeah, right. right. So and that that then that's kind of it's the same structure but different assets. Okay. Right. Okay, cool. Um, and we're going to do just a basic fund structure review, some of the charts that we went over last week. So here's the basic private equity fund structure. Again, this might look very familiar to some. You have your investors who are your, when I say LP, I mean the investors of the fund that are giving their capital to the fund. So they're giving, they're writing checks and they're putting in this big pile of money, right? Then the financial sponsor, and this is one of the definition terms that I went over at the beginning. The GP and the management company, imagine those as like the same thing, right? The financial sponsor is the GP. So investors are giving their money to the fund, and then the GP has the ability to invest that money as they see fit, pursuant to their investment strategy on behalf of the LPs. So the LPs are basically saying, hey, Mr. GP, 
here's my money, I want you to make me money. I want you to make me more money with it. And in what we're talking about today, in buyout private equity, in private equity, you're gonna do that by buying portfolio companies. Um, and then you're gonna, you know, the GP, and we're not gonna go into like the promote structure, but you know, you should know about carried interest and the promote interest and the GPs, what you can take away from this part is, GPs are incentivized by the way that the returns work to make as high of a return as possible um, for the LP investors. So the way that this fund structure has um, evolved and developed in, in our modern era is aligning the interest of, in, of LP investors in GP sponsors, which is the private equity company. Here it's just shown a little differently. Your private equity firm, um, which is the GP, and then they have a fund, and then this fund is investing in deals. So when I say, you know, when there's a portfolio company and there's an LBO, when that run talks about, when you go on pitch book and you can find deals, things you can find are these deals here. You can find situations where investment bankers have brokered deals where there has been a buyout. Um, and they're gonna buy these deals, they're gonna buy these portfolio companies on behalf of the limited partners here. And again, your LPs can be individuals, high net worth. You know, there's going to be um, you know minimum requirements of you know how many assets that you have in order for you to invest in, in, in a fund. But there's also institutional um, investors, like we said, you know pension funds. So the Nebraska Pension Fund might want to get a piece of this. Um, insurance companies, the fund of funds, family offices, uh, sovereign wealth funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're going to talk about the private equity life cycle. And uh, there's one framework to review here, uh, and this is it. So how, how private equity funds work is they're gonna come up with your fund strategy, okay? After you come up with your fund strategy, you're gonna fundraise, and you're gonna communicate the merits of your fund strategy. After you're done fundraising, and this, this takes up a large part of the, life, of the life of the fund. Not necessarily coming up with the fund strategy, but the fundraising part. After you're done fundraising, you're gonna make investments on behalf of the money that you raised from the LPs. Those investments are gonna be, uh, include an acquisition of a company, you're gonna hold the company for some period of time, you're gonna do some magic to it, and then you're gonna exit. After you do this you know, several times, uh, depending on the size of the fund, you, just, you might do this once, you might do this several times, you're gonna close the fund and you're gonna distribute the profits to investors. So you can get a fund strategy, This is how we're gonna come up um, with how the fund is gonna make LP investors money. And the culmination of the research and the expertise of the individuals working in the private equity firm is the investment thesis. The investment thesis is your, your claims as to how you're gonna make, turn the LP funds $100 million into $500 million. This is an example of an investment thesis. Um, it, it, looks, it looks to be just a part of the investment thesis for the acquisition of Avalon Bay communities. Uh, they might be a home builder. Um, and they're kind of talking about mitigants, but this kind of just gets into the, uh, kind of lets, allows to appear into the brains of some of the people making this investment thesis. They're talking about the risk of rising interest rates. They're saying as the private equity firm, as the GP, we're actually gonna help Avalon Bay communities by discouraging home ownership and making renting more attractive. 83% of ABB's debt is fixed rate with an average maturity of 10 years. Valuation implications, they're worried about how this is gonna impact the valuation of the company. Even if the cost of debt rises from three to five percent, the company would still be undervalued by 10% in the base case. And you're gonna see a lot of this language when you're talking about investment theses as it pertains to uh, the acquisitions of different companies. You know, what's happening in the economy? Uh, what changes can you, what, what are the variables? What levers can they pull? What are the implications on the valuation? Because at the end of the day, what they care about is selling this company for more than they bought it for. Same store rental growth and revenue and a lot forecast. Um, this is part of the underwriting process. Uh, develop, development pipeline should boost five year revenue, uh, compounded annual growth rate by 4%. Um, so they're saying that the, the homes that are gonna be developed is gonna boost revenue um, year over year. Consensus forecast assume only three to four percent annualized growth, implying almost no development contribution. Um, so basically, what they're saying here is that even if there aren't any developments, there's still going to be annualized growth. And then they're talking about what are the implications on value. Uh, cumulative NOI for development activity boosts the share price by ten percent. Um, 
So this is the investment thesis. It's, yes. I have a question for you. Yeah. For the first line right there, do you guys see why they say fixed interest rates? Do you guys know why that matters? I pick on someone who guess. How about you in the quarter? Can you guess why that might matter? Today, um, as opposed to say 2015? Fixed interest rates, you said? Yeah. To ensure you're not losing money, I'm assuming to make sure you have like a constant amount um, uh, that you're constantly profiting, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's essentially, well, what's happening today is my question. Like, are interest rates low, like federally, like across the US? Are they high? I don't know. They're high. They're high. Interest rates are really high. So when you have a fixed interest rate, it actually hedges against any rising or you know vol volatile interest rates. In private equity, a majority of what they do, yes, they raise capital, but they're using leveraged buyouts, which is debt. They're raising debt, and they need to pay down this debt every year. So in order to hedge against that, they try to make sure that the interest rates that they have on there are fixed. That's why that's largely important. At any point, if the private equity firm can't pay down their debt, the fund closes, and then everybody, all the investors have a loss. That's why it's important. Leverage buyout is debt. Thank you. It's very good. Um, the other part of fund strategy is, you know, some of the considerations. Yes. Sorry. Is is it possible to like refinance uh, when it comes to fixed interest rates? Like, can they if if interest rates drop below that, like, can they refinance that, or is that only like with like mortgages that you could do? No, that that's an amazing question, and it depends on. General answer: Yes, and that's something that a lot of uh, yeah, and that's universal for all debt, mortgages, for yeah. debt, um, not really bonds, but yeah. you know, loans. But it's going to be pursuant to the loan docs and the loan agreement because every time that you get a loan, it's different terms. A loan is a loan is a contract, and as you guys progress through the business school curriculum, you're going to take business law and you're going to learn a whole lot about contracts. But a loan is essentially an agreement. Um, that you're gonna you're gonna borrow money, the price that you're borrowing the money for is the interest, and there's different things that they can tap on to that contract. Right. So in some cases, your loan agreement might be very nice, and they might let you pay it off early and refinance the lower interest rate. That's a strategy that is wow. extremely common in real estate. Certain businesses use it, um, but typically, I would not say typically. I would say in some cases, there's gonna be different things in the loan agreement that might not let you do that. For example. It might not let you do that outright. It might just say you have to pay this loan off until either right. it, it goes to zero or until a specified date once the loan matures. It might just say, sorry, can't refinance. Or there might be some, some yield maintenance provisions in there. So they might say, just to think about the way that a loan works. If you pay your loan off early, what is the lender missing out on? On interest. On interest, right. So lenders, when they make loans, they, they, don't, they want to make loans. They want to know, okay, we're going to get that interest rate. That's part of their calculus with right, right. But they're, they're investors, right? Okay. They're getting that money from somewhere. Yeah. So sometimes there's going to be yield maintenance in there where they're going to say, okay, if you're going to pay the loan off early, you have to pay a little more than the loan balance to account for that. Uh -huh. um, there, and there's different, more financy, technical ways that, that uh, uh, kind of financial engineering that they uh, make for that yield maintenance to occur. But I would say generally speaking, yes, you can refinance at a lower interest rate. Okay. The, the government prevents those types of penal, prepayment penalties for mortgages, for home mortgages. Right. Um, but you know, in, in this situation, it'd be pursuant to the loan agreement. Yeah, it's a Thank you. Um, okay, effective returns and promote structure. Um, so that that promote structure with carried interest, um, the GPLP dynamic. We covered a lot of that last week. That's going to be part of the fund strategy. To me, a big part of like how the actual you know, I'm actually not even going to get into that. But that's a big part of how the private equity fund is going to make their money. Um, is, is this thing right here. How long will the fund last? This is huge. If we go back to the, to the framework, this is a big deal just in terms of the implications of the type of investments that you can make. Um, and then kind of the risk profile of the fund. Um, and then deal sourcing. So deal sourcing is a big part of a fund strategy. Investment bankers, management teams, um, they're gonna try and pitch deals. Analysts all the way through MDs are be tasked with analyzing. The, the business economic landscape at the time and identifying opportunities. And this is why deal sourcing is super important still to ascertain 
Um, and this is why networks of private equity associates are so important. The networks of, the, of, the, of, the, of a private equity associate is more and more important the higher up you climb on the private equity ladder because if you're a managing director at a private equity company, you're expected to have a bunch of connections and know a bunch of people that can help you source deals. Because a lot of these, because it's private, a lot of the information that you're dealing with, a lot of the opportunities that go across your desk, they're not necessarily available to the public. So, you, so if you're gonna source a deal at the highest level, for example, we're gonna talk about a deal today, that's this, um, this, this, this factory hardware equipment company out in Milwaukee. Um, you need to know the guy that works there. You need to know a guy who dealt with that company in a, in a kind of in a professional capacity. This is, why some, this is a big part of some private equity firm strategy. This is why Carlisle is based out of Washington, D.C. because they invest in a lot of companies that um, deal with government contracts and they want to be close to those networks. So deal sourcing is a big deal um, in terms of fund strategy. And it has kind of touches on like a lot of the soft skills that you need in order to be able to succeed in this space. A lot of deals are made behind closed doors and there's a lot of whispers. Um, it's not a very, um, not a very facey industry. So the next step um, is fundraising. Um, so you have capital commitments, capital calls, and the role of investment banks. Um, so after you've successfully been able to fundraise, um, your investors, your LP investors, are going to give you capital commitments. And this is just a kind of an interesting um, detail about private equity thought I would bring up is you're not actually um, writing, you, you have to make a kind of like a down payment on the amount of money that you're going to commit to the fund. You don't actually have to, if you, if you are committing $50 million to Blackstone's fund, you don't actually have to give them a $50 million, you don't have to, you don't have, you don't have to actually give Blackstone a $50 million check the day that you commit. You give them, a, you might give them two, $5 million. And then you're going to have capital calls as Blackstone makes those investments where you're uh, contractually obligated to then give them the money. So it's a cool way, uh, detail into how private equity works. And then you have the role of investment banks. They're involved in all aspects of this process. You know, when it comes when it comes to dealing with private equity companies. On the fundraising side, investment banks might represent private equity companies to investors um, and present these funds to investors. And then when the fund is actually formed, the private equity company is part of the process that brings that kind of makes the LBO happen. So the two companies will go to the investment bank, it'll facilitate that, it'll broker that LBO. And then when it's time for the fund to dispose, the investment banks are on, they're, they're kind of all hands on deck in terms of, okay, selling the company that was bought out to a new firm, a new private equity fund, either bringing it public again, um, and then the disposition of capital, because you're dealing with a bunch of um, very, very, very um, large numbers. And the investment banks can help the PE company distribute their capital to their investors. We're going to have UBS's ultra high net worth um, network because I had an internship last spring. Um, and this is kind of going into the, the real estate version of the LBO is called a syndication. Um, so the, it was a development out of, it was a development, it was a condo that was being built in West Palm Beach. And I thought this was cool to add because we were talking about like who the investors were and kind of thinking about this as if it's an LBO of a condo. Um, a lot of the investors in the building um, were actually coming from UBS's ultra high net worth high net worth networks. So when you think about the role of investment banks in this process, here's one example is they're trying to put together the financing to put a building together. They need to raise money for their fund. Um, they're going to UBS and they're saying, hey, we have this investment pitch. This is our investment thesis. We're gonna do X, Y, and Z to this building. This is the market. Uh, this is the amount of demand we think that the building's gonna get. This is the demand drivers for the market. This is what we think we're gonna sell the building for. And this is how much we think the investors are gonna make. And UBS uh, job is to represent them to this ultra high net worth, uh, these ultra high net worth networks. This is why this, these offerings are typically private because a lot of times you're not going to see what goes on here at, at our level. A lot of these deals that happen again are behind closed doors. There's stringent requirements to get into this network, and then you know these people have money; they're making these investments all the time. They're kind of just picking and choosing what UBS is going to present to them. Just just peering into this world and how this works. Okay, after your fundraising, you're gonna make your investments. Um, and in this world, in the private equity world, you're gonna acquire a company, and you're gonna acquire it through a leveraged buyout. A leveraged buyout is the acquisition of a company using a large amount of debt. We're gonna go into detail about how the LBO process works. It's very essential to know if you wanna do investment banking, you wanna do private equity one day. This is kind of the foundation for how private equity operates and the way that private equity makes 
a lot of money. What you see here is Blackstone's leverage buyout of Hilton Hotels. And this was in 2007. They bought, the, they bought Hilton for $26 billion. Can anybody guess how much of that $26 billion was debt? Anyone raise their hand? About in the back. Oh, right there. Around 60%, I guess. That's a, that's a good guess. It was actually 78.4% of that was debt. So close to 80% of the acquisition of Hilton Hotels by Blackstone was debt. So when I mentioned the underwriting process, um, the banks that originate this debt underwrite that debt, right? So they're underwriting this deal. And this is why investment banking is such a lucrative job is because you have to have the ability when you're looking at these deals. And when you say an investment banker, you're getting deal experience, it's looking at deals like this and coming to a conclusion as an analyst, do I think that the loan and the debt we're getting to Blackstone, is this a, is this a sound investment? Is, 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 does Hilton have the fundamentals to be able to carry this debt? Does Blackstone have what it takes to be able to do something to this company that they're going to be able to return us this money that we're letting? So you're un actually underwriting the company. You're kind of making a conclusion as to whether or not this can be financed, whether or not we can give 80% debt to Blackstone, and whether or not it's a safe investment for our bank to make. Um, and one last thing to note about the deal sourcing thing and kind of what I just mentioned. This is also why if you want to end up doing this one day in PE, why they oftentimes recruit from investment banks, because like I said, you're on all, you're on all hands on deck on this process. Um, so what happens after the firm is bought out? You're gonna engage in value generation or whatever kind of buzzword way you can describe it. Uh, it's, the, it's how you're gonna get the, 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 the purchase price to be here and then the sale price to be all the way up here. These are different ways that private equity companies do it. They reduce costs and create synergies, um, which means they're gonna find more efficient ways to do things, um, or they'll have the expertise to be able to kind of merge business units and then have cost savings from that, or they might they might merge two companies together if they bought, they're buying two at the same time, create synergies that way. You might install new management teams. This is very common. Um, getting a new CEO, getting a new C-suite, change of leadership, change of strategy. Introducing product lines, developing markets. People behind the PE firm might have knowledge and expertise that uh, the old management team of the company didn't have, and they're able to do this in a more effective way. Um, and restructuring the organization. How can they, how can they from, a, from a corporate governance standpoint, make the optimized the way that the organization is ran? This is why, again, PE firms typically require years of work experience, hire from investment banks. Um, they prefer to have people that work there that have MBAs because it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of intellectual power to be able to do this successfully. You know, it's not a walk in the park to be able to do these, perform these tasks successfully. Um, and, then, and it's also, you're not dealing with small amounts of money, you're dealing with a, with a $28.6 billion buyout. If you fail, a lot of people lose a lot of money. Um, so there's a lot of writing on the people working at these firms, and a lot of the businesses that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis are private equity, uh, or companies owned by private equity. Okay. Yeah, you're exit, you're gonna sell the company for a multiple of what it was bought for. So this is Rex Nord. Um, this is what I mentioned, this is the company that I mentioned earlier. In 2002, Carlisle, which is a traditional buyout private equity fund, purchased Rex Nord for $913 million. 2006, they sold it for $1.825 billion. The equity that the fund had in the deal was $180 million originally. So I'm percent written down. Um, that's, let me see, top of my head, that's about 20%, a little less than 20%. Um, was, so again, this is 80% LTV, they're taking out a ton of debt to make this purchase, and then they're selling it for a 10, for a 10X multiple. Does anyone know who Jerome Powell is? Yes. Who is he? He's the federal board chair, right? Correct. So, again, when you think about this network, this, this kind of this idea that private equity is very network-based, um, a lot of things happen behind closed doors. Jerome Powell sourced this deal. He worked on this deal. He was a partner at Carlisle. 
when this deal occurred, occurred. And it was his mid-40s in 2006 when it was sold. He retired after this, after Rex Norton was sold to another pyrogram firm, Apollo. So you can kind of see why this industry is something that people buy after. And you also kind of see the challenges. You know, in order to think about if you ever want to become Fed chairman someday, kind of it's a pedigree, the resume that you need. You know, you're competing against a pool of people that have done deals like this. You know, made a 10x multiple of $913 million in $2002. It's not easy to do. And you're going to close. Um, so I do have one clip for you guys. I just said to end this off. Oh, yes. Um, so the sourcing, so you just said like the sourcing in like venture capital, for example, it's usually like the analysts, like the beginner analysts that source those deals for venture capital firms, but for, for private equity, it's the higher like ranking members of the, of the fund that, that source them, like partners. And I mean, I, and you, you can pitch in. I would say it's kind of a kind of a full firm effort. I think that if you're you're an analyst and you're able to, if you're an, you're an analyst and, and you got your MBA from Harvard, you did you did your first yeah. investment banking, you got your MBA from Harvard, and you're going to Carlisle, you know, even if you go to you you already just as a function of the type of person that these firms hire, have a network that is light years ahead of say the average you know worker you know average american yeah. Yeah. employee right okay. Okay. so as an analyst you might be able to source a deal and then you probably get a lot of clout in the firm yeah right yeah although because you're still you know you're not senior you're still kind of you know you're the little guy it might be harder right yeah. it's, it's easier for jerome powell you know by this time in his career he already was under secretary of the treasury under george hw bush you know, he had already done a lot of stuff. He was a, he was an investment banker himself, um, so it's easier for him to be able to source a deal like this through his network. You know, the guy was born and raised in D.C., um, but absolutely, you can source deals. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. During the holding phase, how much involvement does the private equity firm have into like the day-to-day -day processes of the firm? Yeah. Or is it a, very much external? That's a great question, and it kind of goes into like this fun strategy part of the entire process. Um, I can tell you from experience, Rialto, and this is an interesting kind of tidbit, you know, Rialto, the company, although they, you know, they, they're a private equity company, right? They raise funds, and then they, they, you know, they distribute the, the profits to LPs, but they're owned by a private equity company. So you can kind of see how you know, a lot of these things can come full circle, but to answer your question, Rialto never, ever Hears from the private equity company, and like I had a lot of exposure to like the people in the C suite of the company I worked for, and they kind of basically say, you know, it was it was kind of a they, they gave us a lot of space, they gave us a lot of respect, and the reason why they wanted us in their portfolio was because the C suite of Rialto is very very experienced. You might have different situations where, you know, private equity companies are very involved in fast food. When I was researching doing the research for this presentation, I read a lot about deals that have been done for fast food, and you have situations like. You know the purchase of Popeyes um, coming out of you know the early 2010s completely changed the business. You know, pop, you know people actually eat at Popeyes now. You know, way, way, way more than they used to. I, you know, I don't, but way more than they used to. Um, you know, the introduction of, like the chicken sandwich. You know, that's just one anecdote, right? But there, but there's situations in which you're going to actually go in. The private equity company is very hands-on, and that's all pursued in the fund strategy. So they actually have a. And I'll just add this before you follow up. They've actually got a very negative reputation. It's, you know, private equity has is pretty controversial. If you look up articles, you probably find a lot of negative press on the way in which private equity companies uh, make companies more efficient and cut costs. Because what does cutting costs entail? You know, what's a big way a company can cut costs? Layoffs. Exactly, and and they're known for that. I see. So just to clarify, it depends on the industry and like industry and fund strategy, but yes. in general, yeah, general, it has it gains bad press. Right. Yes. Um, for an LBO, is the investment like the debt? Is it just coming from investment banks, or does it come from like private investors as well? To be that's, considered? that's an amazing question. Um, it doesn't. I wouldn't. Well, you know, that's that's interesting. I don't know if it comes from private. I mean, I guess when you think about debt, if it would come from private investors, but maybe not in the way that you think. Like if 
Like th th there's funds that your job is to originally just kind of get, um, and then you banks originally this debt, and it, it's there's something it's way more complicated than than the scope of this presentation. There's something called a collateralized loan obligation. Banks actually originally this debt, and then they're going to securitize it, sell it to really like, retail investors, as CLOs, and like there's there's a lot of different um, ways that this debt is that this debt uh, is originated. We're going to talk about that when we cover LBOs two weeks from now. Um, it's also tranche, which again is beyond the scope of this presentation, but we'll talk about it when we cover LBOs two weeks from now. There's different levels of debt. So you'll have like, you know, if the bank makes a loan, it's like sit on your balance sheet. It might have like the first lien, it might be the first you know, first uh, first loan, senior debt, which means that that debt gets paid first as the lowest interest rate, and then there's levels of debt on top of that. Um, you might have like mezzanine debt, um, and then debt that's, that's further down the tranche that has a higher uh, interest rate. Um, just to get them to where they need to be in order to in order to hit that. Like if they're buying perhaps for $13 million, they're used $180 million. Not all that 80% is coming from one loan. It's simply coming from different debt sources. And there's there's funds and there's thing, you know, entities that invest, that, that their form of investment is originating these, these loans. Yes? Someone over here? Oh, sorry. All right. Anyone else? Yes. Wait, I was, I was just curious. Rialto, they're owned by like a fund of funds? Um, no, so, so that's, that's a good question, kind of honing the business station. They're owned by private equity. And private equity owns the, the, the corporation that is Real, you know, Rialto Management LLC. And, and then Rialto LLC is, is, what, is what's raising the funds. R Rialto is raising the funds. So when you think about that type of ownership, their, the private equity company that owns Rialto is invested in Rialto's ability to raise funds, generate adequate returns, and make that carry interest and make that promote. And then that, that's where Rialto's financial metrics in terms of Rialto's profits come from, is their ability to do the same thing that the fund that enables the private equity company to invest in Rialto in the first place to do, right? So it kind of can get pretty... So it is a fund of funds. Well, 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 no, because it's not... They're not investing in Rialto's fund. They own Rialto outright. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Uh, so I, I do want to end, let's see. Yeah, 657, I'm gonna end on a three minute video. I did have this like, history slide, but it seems pre pretty hairy. Um, so maybe we'll just talk about <coughs> the next week. Um, but I'm gonna end on this, on this close. Uh, so, let me actually preface this video just by, this is showing the close of a fund. And I showed a video last week from the Big Short where the uh, investor was very upset with the fund strategy. Uh, well, it's, it's beyond the fund strategy. The, the investor's upset at this point. So there's an, there's an investor, there's an LP in the fund. So this is a hedge fund, but you know, same, 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 same basic concept. He's upset in this space. Showed that video last week. He wants his money back. He doesn't like the investments that the fund is making. Um, and then now we're gonna see that fund close. And that's how we're gonna end off today. Yeah. So you get the link. Same for pizza, right? We got a whole other pizza. Oh, we got. It's not pizza. There we go. How do I reach the volume here? Sitting here trying to be real time and decipher all that jargon. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> dude. I had my computer. I was typing into the <laughs> yeah. I was like, hold on. Oh, I'm like, fuck, man. I should have watched the other videos. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Maybe we also turn on caption. All right, so I'm going to just preface this. This is Michael Murray's hedge fund. Um, who's watched the big short? Okay, cool. Yeah, we're very familiar with the background of the, of the great financial crisis, so I won't even go into that. Thank you. Um, but just to end off the day, this is Michael Berry closing his fund. You have 15 messages. Well, the first thing that I want to do is call me to the English. It's just, I, you're buying a stock? The market's at an all time low, which is crazy. I met my wife on Match.com. My profile said, I am a medical student with only one eye, in an awkward social manner, and we have $45,000 in student loans. And she wrote back, You're just what I've been looking for. She meant honest. So let me be honest. The housing crisis represents the greatest financial opportunity of a human being. It's not like I thought it would be. This business. Care is the part of life that is essential, the part that has nothing to do with business. I know you're going to get started, so let's... For the past two years, my insights have felt like they're eating themselves. All the people I respect and don't talk to me in the morning, except for the lawyers. People authority to tell them how value things, but they choose this authority not based on facts or results. They choose it because it seems authoritative and familiar and, uh, and never have been familiar. So, so I've come to some realization that I must close down the fund. Sincerely, Michael J. Barry, MD. So his fund made 489% profit by shorting the housing market. And then with that amount of profits, uh, they carried interest. Michael Burry actually in real life uh, didn't have to be a fund manager anymore, didn't have to be a GP. He, he started his own family office, which means you have so much money that you don't have to, you don't have to invest other people's money to make your money. You can invest your own money and then live off of the return of those investments. Just off of this, this trade. And um, this is, you know, there's, he, he's sad about it because uh, a lot of people have like, lost their homes and stuff, uh, but he made a lot of money. Yeah, he made 2.69. Thank you.